Hey, good morning, Laba. How you doing? Good morning. I'm good. What about you? Good, good. I understand we're in chapter six today, right? Not chapter five. <laughs> okay. Yes. So here we go. Can you see the PowerPoint now, Liba? No. You cannot see the PowerPoint. How about now? Yes, I can. Okay, we'll take a deep breath. We're going to go into chapter six. We're going to be analyzing the inventory dollars, huh? So we're going to classify, determine inventory, apply cost flow methods, say hello to LIFO, FIFO, explain the statement presentation. Here we go. How to classify and determine inventory, huh? We are merchandising. We're merchandising. We only have one kind of inventory. That's called merchandise inventory, okay? Raw materials, work in process, finished goods, that's accounting 240. Let's not worry about those. And inventories are a current asset. There's two systems involved. We went over these in chapter five, apparently. Physical inventory is taken for two reasons under each system. Under a perpetual system, you have, uh, under a perpetual system, you might take an inventory maybe just once a year, just to double check that things are, are, are going okay, all right? Under a periodic system, you have to take a, a, a physical inventory every month in order to come up with financial statements, all right? And what's a physical inventory? It's the actual counting, the weighing, the measuring, each kind of inventory on hand. And it's normally performed when the business is closed or the business is slow. You have to be closed because when you're counting the inventory, you can't have people moving stuff in and out of the stock for customers while you're trying to count. It causes a lot of confusion. It's always done at the end of an accounting period. Goods in transit, okay? Goods in transit, purchase goods that are not yet received. I ordered some fact. I ordered some uh, machine parts from your factory in Santa Barbara, Liba, and you put them on a truck to New Jersey. Th while that truck is going across the country, that's called goods in transit. Goods in transit should be included in the inventory of the company that has legal title, and legal title is determined by terms of sale. So what we're saying here, Liba, is your your truck left your warehouse on April 1st at eight in the morning. Depending on the terms, I may already be the owner of those goods or you may be the owner until they get to me. Freight costs, what are freight costs? That's the cost of the truck, the railroad, train, whatever, whatever you're paying to get the goods from one destination to another, okay? Let's talk a little bit about FOB. You see that little word there, FOB shipping point and FOB destination? Freight on board, okay? Freight on board. The FOB point in time, Liba, is when title to the goods changes, okay? FOB shipping point, FOB shipping point. It means that as soon as the goods ship, the buyer owns them. So you ship me a whole bunch, you ship me a truckload of parts. As soon as that truck left your factory, I owned it. I'm responsible for paying the freight. My insurance will take care of any accidents or anything. If it's FOB destination, then you, the seller, own it until it gets to me. And companies can argue about these terms because one can be uh, an advantage to another. And they're always talking about them. So FOB shipping point, FOB destination. Goods in transit should be included in the inventory of the buyer when the terms are FOB shipping point. What, is the, what does the FOB mean? The point in time where ownership 
of the goods changes, when title changes. Consigned inventory, what's consigned inventory? Goods held that are owned by other parties. The consignee, the people holding it, try to sell the goods for the consignor for a fee without ever owning it. You ever go into Macy's? Remember when you go into Macy's downtown and the first thing you notice is you smell perfume. The women are behind those kiosks schlepping uh, jugs of perfume. That perfume does not belong to Macy's. It belongs to Longvin. It belongs to Chanel. What they did was they consigned that inventory. They said to Macy's, we'll set you up with all the all of our products and you don't have to pay it. You don't have to pay for them. You don't have to pay for them until you sell them. So the deal is you will pay us $40 for every jug that you sell. And hopefully Macy sells a whole bunch of them for say $200 for Macy's sake. And you, the con consignor, gets the uh, paid for your inventory. Has been company completed its inventory count. It had a total value of $200,000. Now we have some information here we want to look at. We physically counted $200,000. Discuss how this information affects the physical count. Wow, first jolt of the morning. <laughs> Has been included in the inventory goods held on consignment. Should they have counted those goods, Liba? Do those goods belong to Hasbin who are actually holding it? Or does it belong to the people who gave it to them? I'll answer the question for you. It belongs to Falls Company. It does not belong to Hasbin. Hasbin is just going to try to sell it on behalf of Falls. The company did not include a pur purchase goods of 10,000, which were in transit, FOB shipping point. Here, what happened at the shipping point, Liba? I'll ask that question. For number one. Yeah, for number two, the company did not include in the count purchased goods of 10,000, which were in transit. Okay, means they're on a truck somewhere. The terms were FOB shipping point. So they should be added, the $10,000 added to the inventory count? Absolutely, because the, they owned it as soon as it left the, uh, the rail yard of the other company. And then the third one, the company did not include inventory that had been sold where the terms are FOB shipping point. And that was correct. Okay. And here we go. They're showing us the difference. So our original inventory was 200,000, what they counted. Now they have to subtract out 15 and they have to add in the 10 and the third item was done correctly. And where I worked for many years, we had consigned inventory all over the country. We had inventory at different locations, different factories and warehouses. It, uh, it was a pretty daunting thing to take that inventory uh, once a year. Cost flow methods. I think you'll like this live, but cost flow methods. Inventory is accounted for at cost. Everything is at cost on our balance sheet, right? We know that. Costs include all expenditures necessary to acquire goods and place them in a condition for sale. And then we come up with unit costs. We're going to come up with four methods, okay? Specific ID, first in, first out, known as FIFO, last in, first out, known as LIFO, and average cost, okay? Specific ID. An actual physical flow costing method in which terms are specifically costed to arrive at the total cost of the inventory, very rarely used. Most companies make assumptions about which units are sold. So specific ID, uh, LIBA, that's the only method that matches the physical movement of the goods. You know, use a specific ID, an auto dealership. When I bought my Ford, my Ford Edge about eight years ago, I went in there and I said, I'll take that car right there. I'll buy that model. Well, I gave the guy my check. Did he say, okay, go out into the parking lot, take whatever Ford Edge you want, drive it home? No, he has to know exactly what car he sold in case the car is in an accident or there's a recall. So specific ID is a very easy method, 
because it matches the physical flow of the goods. And here's an example. Krivitz TV Company purchased three identical 50 inches on different dates. So during the year, they had one, they had three, one TV for 700, 750, and 800. And then they sold two at 1200. They have to know exactly which two they sold from that inventory. It could have been the one from uh, February 3rd and May, March 5th, or it could have been March 5th and the 22nd or any permutation. And it turns out they sold the ones that purchased on the third and uh, on the third and the 22nd. So the cost of goods sold labor to be subtracted from that 2,400 would be 700 for the February 3rd and 800 for the May 23rd. That means their ending inventory on, T on this particular item is $750. Specific ID, it matches the real world exactly. The other methods are allocation methods, they're estimates, and they have nothing to do with how the goods are moving, okay? And that's so important to understand. And they're just showing you that FIFO was used by most companies, or maybe not most companies, but a plurality of companies, 45%. Some use LIFO and then average costing and other. Data for cost flow assumptions. Let's take a real good look at this, okay? This is your template for doing your homework, for doing your problems here. You're going to lay out the beginning inventory, 100 times 10, and then in chronological order, you're going to list the purchases. You're going to add them down, multiply across, and you're going to come up with the available for sale. The available for sale. At the end of the month, they're telling you that they had 450 left in the inventory. So we did not sell 450. What did we sell? We sold 550, the difference between the 1,000 and the, five, and the uh, 550, okay? And the 450 rather, okay? First in, first out. The earliest goods purchased are the first to be recognized or the, it really would be the beginning inventory and then the earliest purchases. And sometimes this matches the, the real world a little bit, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. First in, first out. I mean, when you go to the supermarket and you buy milk, that milk was, has only been out there for a couple of days before it goes bad. So they're pretty much selling the, the uh, newest stuff, the oldest stuff first to get rid of it. Companies determine units and costs of the inventory, starting with the unit cost of the most recent purchase, working backwards. I hate they keep saying purchase, I should say beginning inventory, but okay. So let's take a look at our sheet again. This is, this is the same information we saw before, okay? Now, what they're telling you is that at the end of the month, they sold a certain amount. At the, end of the, at the end of the month, they're telling you they sold, how many units did they sell? They sold 550, okay? 450 were still in the inventory and 1,000 were available. So how do we get this cost of goods sold here of 550? We take the 12,000 minus the ending inventory. But let's back the truck up a second, Liba. How did they get these numbers for this ending inventory? Well, this is, this is FIFO. So the cost of goods sold is gonna be as follows. You have a pencil there to write this down real quick, Liba? Yes, I do. Okay. We sold 550. Under FIFO, we sold the oldest stuff first. First in, first out. So we're looking for 550. So write down 100 times 10 equals 1,000, right? Then we sold the 200. 200 times 11 equals 2,200. So far, we've sold 300, right? Now we're only looking for another 250. So from the third layer, we go 250 times 12 equals 3,000, 3,000, 6,200. If there's a God in heaven, it'll come out to $6,200. Here's 
Can you triple check that for me, please, Leba? Yes, I can. Did you get 6,200? Yes. Okay. So more importantly, do you understand how we, how we got the 6,200? We got it under FIFO by starting way back at the beginning and working our way down. So that's how we got the, the inventory, the cost of goods sold, 6,200. How did they get the ending inventory? Here they're showing us. Remember we had, remember we used up 250 of that 300 just now? Yes. So you, have, so you have 50 left in the inventory from August 24th and we never got anywhere near the 400. So you multiply those out, you get 5,800 5,800 plus 6,200 equals $12,000, okay? So let's take okay. a peek at our next method here. I said, first in, first out. Another way of thinking about the calculation is, oh, not going to confuse us with that. Now we're going to do LIFO. LIFO. Under this method, we're always selling the newest goods first. Okay. We're not really doing that in the real world, but we're allowed to pretend we are for, for tax purposes and gap purposes. Right, Leiba? So this does not necessarily at all match the real world physical movement. Costs of latest goods purchased are the first to be recognized in determining cost of goods sold. Seldom coincides with actual physical flow of merchandise. Exceptions may be goods stored in piles such as coal or hay. I always, one example of a, of a LIFO that might actually track the uh, real world movement is you open up a hardware store and typically in a hardware store, there's gonna be a garbage can, a big metal garbage can filled with nails. And when you opened up that, that store in 1970, you filled that thing up with nails and you threw a little oil in there to keep it uh, from rusting. And people come in and they scoop nails off the top. And then when the, when the uh, vessel is only half filled, you pour more nails on top. So you never actually sell that first nail. That might be another example, stuff in piles. Last in, first out. Liba, can I ask you to see if you can figure out the cost of goods sold on your own using LIFO? We're going to start with the newest first and work our way from bottom to top, okay? okay. So we sold the same 550. Which 550 did we sell? It's 550. We sold a total of 550 units. Now, under... Five under FIFO, you figured it out. It was 100 times 10, right? Mm -hmm. 200 times 11 and 50 to, 250 times 12. Now we're starting at the bottom. So you've got 400 times 13, right? Yes. And now we're we going to get the next 150. From the beginning? Not the beginning from the more the purchase above that one. We're working on August twenty fourth. Yes. So four hundred times thirteen is fifty two hundred, and then one fifty times twelve is what? Uh, I can't do it in my head. You add them together, you should come up with cost of goods sold of seven thousand dollars. One fifty times twelve is three thousand. They're saying the cost of goods sold is 7,000. 400 times 13 is 5,200. That leaves us with 150 times 12 is 1,800. Okay, so did you agree, do you agree with the 7,000 cost of goods sold on the lower right-hand corner? Yes, Liba? I got the same thing. Okay, and how did they, tell me how they did the ending inventory then. You can just read it right off there. 5,000. 
yeah, the ending inventory was uh, $5,000. How, how did they get those numbers? Where'd, where'd they get the $100 for August 24? The 100 units, rather, for August 24. What do you mean, the 100 units? Yeah, remember 100, we had... 100, 100 or 150? Be a, uh, I can't read that. 150, I'm sorry. Yeah, 150. Yeah, that was left over. And then you go back up to get 200. You go back up to get the 100, right? Yes. So not too bad. Actually, I used to like to do these, actually, where I work, where we had FIFO. List in, first out. List in, first out. Average cost is a fairly easy one to understand. Average cost. We're going to take a weighted average. Very easy. Okay. All right. You see where it says total cost on the top section under goods available for sale? Total cost 12000 Yes. How many units did we have associated with that 12000 1000 What's 12 divided by 1? $12, right? Yes. Your average cost is $12. All you have to do is take the $12, multiply them by the number of units you sold, which was 550, and multiply them by the units you had on hand, which was the 450. So we see the 450 times 12 equals 6,400, right? Or 5,400, right? Could you, could you put in your, your clicker, what's 550 times 12? That better equals 6,600. Sixty-six hundred. Yeah. Do you have any questions on this one? No. Don't make, it's an easy one. Don't make this mistake with some students do. Some students do this. Oh, the average cost. I'm going to add 10, 11, 12, 13 and divide by four. No, that's not going to work. You do it horizontally on the total line, total available line. That's why this template here is crucial. You can't answer any of these LIFO problems unless you set this up for yourself real quick. And you'll need that on the test. Average cost. Here we go. Now we get into some interesting things here. We just did three sets of uh, inventory calculations. Actually four, right? When you count specific ID. So let's take a peek here. Okay, notice the sales are the same, right? For each company, each, I'm sorry, for each method, the sales are the same. And then you've got the same beginning inventory, the same purchases and the same available for sale. So keep that in mind. The available for sale is always going to be the $12,000, 12, 12,000 uh, units, in this case, dollars. And then we have our cost of goods sold gross profit. So what they're showing you here is the income statement, sales revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus operating expenses, which are the same. All right. What do you notice about the net income on the bottom? Which has the highest net income of these three methods? Libo? FIFO. FIFO, exactly. And that's always going to be the case. Because we're only we're only talking a, a world of rising prices. We're never going to worry about uh, deflation. Prices going down. So whenever prices are going up, FIFO will give you the highest inventory. Why do you think that is? Got you stumped on that one, Libra? Yes. Yeah, the, the reason is because you're selling the cheap stuff first. You're selling the older stuff that's at a lower cost. So your cost of goods sold is going to be lower for FIFO. LIFO is the opposite. Look at that. You only had net income of $1,750,000 because you're selling the new high cost items first. An average cost, we would hope, would be in between them, which it is. All right. 
So LIFO, FIFO. FIFO will give you the highest profit. LIFO will give you the lowest profit. Why would a company pick LIFO to show such a low profit, Labor? I'm, 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 I'm asking you a lot of questions today. Maybe they want the highest quality for the newest edition. Yeah, it could be part of it. But you know what a big part of it is? Taxes. You're going to pay less tax uh, income tax on a lower income. They both had the same sales. They paid everything. Everything they bought was the same cost, but their tax burden will be lower. Two three one zero less seventeen fifty. That's about four hundred and sixty dollars. Let's say it's a big company, four hundred and sixty million dollars times one third. This company is going to save itself like about $120 million in taxes that these guys are going to have to pay, and they're not. So that's a good argument for LIFO. But some companies still pick FIFO. In fact, most do. And the reason is they want to show the highest profit possible. They want to have a headline in the newspaper, Pure Later hits target profit of $3 per share. They want to make a big splash. And average cost you might use because it's super easy. You don't have to do all that layering. The layering you have to do with the other methods. In periods of inflation, FIFO higher net income, higher net income, LIFO the lowest. I'm not gonna talk about falling prices. The cost flow method that often parallels the actual physical flow FIFO might, it might not. We don't care. You know, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Mesa Produce Store up by where I live here on the Mesa. They, they use LIFO for their accounting. That means theoretically, they never sold the first bunch of bananas they put out 50 years ago. Well, we know that's nonsense, but they're allowed to pretend. The cost flow method that results in the lowest income taxes is Mr. LIFO. We just went over that, right? And then they talk a little bit about you have to use these consistently. You can't be bouncing back and forth. In your statements, you'll talk about what you do here. The company believes that the use of LIFO method better matches current costs with current revenues. The effect of this change was to decrease net income by 16 million. Companies love to decrease their net income by charges that are not cash. Do it. Cost flow methods. Determine the cost of goods sold under a periodic FIFO. So they're telling you they sold 7,000, right, Liba? Where did they get this? Where did they get the solution? 4,000 came from the beginning and 3,000 from the purchases, okay? Same information, except we're now we're doing FIFO. So 6,000 came out at $4, 1,000 came at three. Look at the difference in the cost of goods sold between the two methods, 27,000 versus, versus 24. The average cost method. Here we have to take that total of 36,000 and divide it by 10, Thousand, we get 360 per unit. That's the easy one. Statement presentation, analysis of inventory. Inventory is a current asset right after receivables. And in a multi-step, you're going to separate the cost of goods sold in the upper layer, all right? And different things that you must disclose. Walmart's going to talk about uh, the fact that they're using last in, first out. Here's a, here's a new concept to understand, Liber, called lower of cost or market. Lower of cost or market, which means net. Lower of cost or net realizable value. Everything on your balance sheet is expressed at cost, okay? If you own a piece of land, you bought land in Santa Barbara 50 years ago for $100,000. That land today is probably worth $5 million. You cannot increase the value of that inventory on your financial statements. You can never, never write the value of an asset up. But if that land deteriorated where it's no longer worth 100,000, you have to write it down. 
So we're going to talk about this, this example of conservatism, it's called in GAAP, that the net realizable value is the amount a company expects to realize from the sale of the item. When the value of the inventory is lower than its cost, we're going to pick it up at the market value. So this is not too, too hard, Liba, so, but let's take a peek at it so you get familiar with it. Assume that Kentucky, get it, Kentucky, uh -huh, TV has the following lines of merchandise with costs and market values as indicated. So let's look at them one by one. Flat screen TVs. He has 100 units on the inventory, right? He has 100. How much did he pay for those units? 600, that's your cost. But your salesman in the market is telling you no one's going to give you $600 for those old fashioned flat screen TVs. You're only going to get 550 if you're lucky. Well, that difference of 550 times 10 represents a write down of $55,000. What was lower, cost or market? Market was lower. So we have to multiply it out by market. Satellite radios. We have 90 on hand. We, we have 500 on hand. We pay 90. They're selling for 104. What's lower, cost or market? Cost is lower. You multiply it out by cost. DVD recorders, lower of cost or market. In this case, the realizable value or market is lower. And same thing with, with DVDs. The, the cost per unit is lower. And we, we stick with the lower of the $5. That makes some sense, Liber, what we're trying to do there? Yes, you just take the lowest cost and then multiply it by the units. That's right. So when you get these problems, don't get confused. If it's lower cost of market, zero in on the lower dollar item. And that's the one you're going to use, okay? Students confuse themselves sometimes on lower of cost of market. They make it too hard. Inventory management is a critical task. We must manage our inventory. We want to have low inventory. We want to have high in We don't want high inventories. In a perfect world, we'd have no inventory. In a perfect world, we would sell the inventory every day and have nothing left and then blow it up the next day. So if you have too high an inventory, you got high storage costs. You might have to pay interest on the money you tied up in that inventory. Uh, the stuff can get broken. So high inventory is a problem. Low inventory is good as long as you don't lose any sales. There's nothing worse than come, someone walks into your store and said, I'm interested in that television. How much is that set? And you say, it's $1,000. And they say, I'll take one. And then you go in the back and come back. Oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have it on hand right now. Can you come back tomorrow? That customer is not coming back tomorrow. You've lost that sale. Okay, inventory turnover, very, very important metric, okay? Inventory turnover, similar to the AR turnover ratio we did. Cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. Let me repeat that, cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. What was the inventory on December 31st, year one? And what was it at December 31st, year two? You add them up, divide by two, right? We're going to take that turnover, and that is called a turnover, and we're going to divide it into a year, 365 to get days. So let's see what we're talking about here. I see cost of goods sold of 361,256, and then there's your ending inventory. So what they're doing is they're taking that 361,256. And they're dividing it by the average inventory. And that gives you a turnover of 8.3 times. What does the turnover mean? Well, it, it means the number of times you sold the average inventory amount. But that's, that's not very clear language to people who don't talk finances. You know, your boss, his expertise may be in engineering, president of the company. He's not going to know what you're talking about with turnovers. So that's why we, we say we'll take the turnover divide it into 365 and come up with the days. So Walmart in 216, 2016, 44 days, it was 45, one. 
Target, wow, 63. What this represents, Liber, it takes 44 days from the time Walmart brings in the product till the time they bill it out to the customer. I'll repeat that. In 44 days, it takes 44 days for Walmart to buy a product and sell it. Obviously, you want those days to be as low as possible. Okay? Inventory turnover. How fast do we sell our goods? Adjustment for life or reserve. I'm not going to go over the adjustment for life or reserve. Here they're talking some, some more lower of cost of market items, okay? Determine the value of the inventory. Now look how easy this is. What did we say? We just picked the lower number, right, Leiba? Yes. Lower of cost of market. Here, they're giving us some inventory turnover figures. They're, they're showing us some sales. We don't, we don't really care about the sales. Cost of goods sold we need, beginning and ending inventory we need. Determine the inventory turnover. Let's take a peek at it. What was the cost of goods sold in 2021? A million dollars, right, Leiba? A million. And then we take the average of 290 and 210 which is 255, whatever that is. We divide it out and then we divide it into the number of days, into the year to get the number of days, okay? Same thing with 2022. Here, the cost of goods sold was 910. On beginning inventory of 210 and 50, uh, different, so it's average of 130. They come up with 52 days. Wow. That's interesting, huh? If these are real numbers, they really gave themselves a nice break, huh? They cut the days down from 91 to 52. That's mighty impressive. Okay. Now we got to take a deep breath. We're going to go into the two different kinds of systems again. Apply cost flow methods to perpetual inventory records. Here, the, assuming the perpetual inventory system compute cost of goods sold on the LIFO FIFO average cost. Now here under the perpetual, we're not waiting until the end of the month to do the LIFO FIFO. We're doing it as it occurs, okay? So you have a beginning inventory of 100 and then you had two purchases that total 500, the 203. And then you had a sale of 500, purchases of 400. And there we go. There is our cost of goods available, $12,000, all right? Under FIFO, perpetual, we're going to look at that first sale. That's, we're going to take that first item, and we're, we're going to layer it out. We had 1000 to begin with, right? Take a peek here. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. We had 1000 at the beginning inventory. And then we brought in two and three, 200 at 11 plus 100 at 10 gives you 3,200. Then we brought in more 100 at 10 and 200 at 11. You multiply them out and now we're up to 6,800. Then comes the sale. What did we sell? We sold 100 from the first layer, 200 from the second, and 200 from that layer and 50 from there. I don't want to spend too much time on this other than to get you to understand that under the perpetual system, you are doing these FIFO calculations almost every day based on what's happened so far. When you get to the end of the month, it should come out the same numbers you had under the other system. And they do the same thing with last in, first out, and the and the average cost. See, here's the, the average cost demonstrates it a little better. I think you have a beginning of a thousand, and then they purchase twenty two hundred and thirty six hundred dollars. That gets you up to eight hundred dollars, and then you had an average cost of eleven thirty three times the sales, which was fifty five six five seven six seven. That's a misprint there to get the number. All right, let's talk about the appendix a little bit. 
I think this is a good, sometimes I don't go into the appendix if I don't think it's useful, but here we go. Inventory errors. Hey, one way you can really botch up your financial statements is to make an error counting the inventory. Okay. Counting the inventory. If you don't count the inventory, right, it's going to infect your bottom line, your net income. All right. So let's see what they have for us. Inventory errors. An error in costing ending inventory of the current period will have a reverse effect on the following month, okay? What I mean is this, Libra. At the end of 2021, you counted your inventory, but you forgot to count that box in the corner. That box has $100,000 worth of goods in it. You forgot to count it. Because you made that mistake, you understated the net income for that year. But you not only messed up this year, you automatically messed up next year as well. Because next year, you're starting off with an inventory number that's incorrect. So if you fail to count something, you are understating the inventory. If you count too much, you're overstating the inventory. So this is a useful grid to look at here. Just look at the where it says ending inventory. Ignore beginning inventory. We don't care about that. Your ending inventory is understated. Your net income is going to be understated because your cost of goods sold is going to be overstated. You're telling you're telling the world you sold those that box, which is still sitting there. You haven't sold it. If the ending inventory is overstated, you're going to reduce your cost of goods sold, and net income is going to be overstated. So you know on the test, there could be a couple of at least multiple choice questions about this. So let's take a good look here, all right? Here, they're showing you the incorrect and correct. If things were done correctly, you would have income of $25,000 the first year and 10 the next year, total of 35, right? But look what happened here. You understated the inventory. Here they made a mistake. Here it was done correctly, where it says correct. Here they understated the inventory by 3,000. Look what it did to your net income for that year. You understated your net income. I mean, that's a big miss. You, you, you know, that's, that's a big miss. $3,000 over 25, three or it. That's about 11%. That's a, that's a bad miss. Your bosses could be looking at that net income and they're saying, man, we only made 22 million. We were expecting to make 25. I'm going to have to start laying people off. And they start making decisions that are contrary to good management. So we come back to the next year and they did things correctly the next year. And they're showing income of 10. But look what happened here. Our ending inventory number of 12,000 should have been 15, but we're stuck with it going into the new year. So instead of showing a profit of 10, we're showing a profit of 13. 22,000 incorrect plus 13,000 incorrect equals 35,000. 25,000 correct plus 10,000 incorrect equals the same 35,000. You, you've just messed up two years, okay? You fail to count something, you're understating your net income. Understanding inventory will overstate, understating, what's the answer to this one, Liva? What you doing? Understating inventory will overstate what? Cost of goods. You are correct. Very good, very good. Balance sheet effective errors, we already know this. We just went over this. And that takes us to the end of our lesson. So that was kind of an interesting chapter, huh? And yeah, it was interesting, different. Yeah, yeah, a little different stuff. Do you have any questions or anything? No. All no. right. You explained it really good. All right. So, so, you, so you've gone to my YouTube channel for some of these lectures? No, I, I take notes while during the lecture. Uh huh. 
and then I do the reading. So I don't have, I don't go back. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you got, you stopped me on chapter five today. All right. So let's call it a day. Okay, Laiba. Okay. Have a good rest of your day. Hey, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.